1917 for the Australians uh, got that uh, name, the Marne Division, when uh, they actually uh, stoically defended against the Germans and became known as the Rock of the Marne. Uh, and that's why they're the Marne Division. Um, and uh, that is what I'm about to talk about today. Um, so on Monday, uh, the 16th of December 19, uh, 2013, um, uh, my wife and I have been up to visit our uh, uh, then 95-year-old auntie, who's an artilleryman, who had 9.2-inch guns uh, with coastal artillery during the Second World War. And we're on our way back, and uh, the phone call comes from Paul Nottard, uh, Brigadier Paul Nottard, who was the Director General of the Green Army at the time, our commander of the uh, 16th Combat Service Support Brigade. Uh, and we just listened on the news to the fact that uh, uh, the Prime Minister uh, at the, the time, Tony Abbott, turned around and said, uh, troops are out of Afghanistan. Pull out of Afghanistan. And uh, Paul Novard uh, turns to me and says, hey, uh, Philip, we've, we've got an offer for you. How do you like to go to Afghanistan? And uh, my wife sort of looked at me, as you can well imagine, at that stage and, uh, and said, uh, um, I'll, I'll get back to you, Paul. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, five minutes later, I gave him a call back and said, uh, look, I'd love to do it. Uh, he said, look, you know, we're not quite sure about it at this stage. Uh, my wife didn't talk to me for the next three days, uh, as you can well imagine. Uh, and then that Friday, literally four days later, the Chief of the Army gave me a call, uh, knocked on the door three times and said, you sure you really want to go? Are you sure you really want to go? Are you sure you really want to go? And I said, yes. And he said, that's it. Life changes forever. And so a very short spin-up, uh, literally short spin-up, um, I then deployed uh, to the original command east uh, with the 10th Mountain Division. Uh, on the 1st of 2nd of January, I was in America for two weeks with the, uh, the 10th Mountain up at uh, Fort Drum, up at uh, uh, New York, in a very, very cold time of the year. In blizzardy condition, we're actually locked in uh, for a couple of days. Uh, we get out of the mansion, Andy Bell Mansion, that we'll be in. Uh, and then uh, by uh, the beginning of February, I was doing my first recreation and then uh, I got on plane across there. So, a really quick flash today, but opportunity of a lifetime. Uh, just down the bottom there, uh, um, chap in the middle is uh, Major General Stephen Townsend, now Lieutenant General Stephen Townsend, who's the commander of the 18th Airborne Corps now, was commander of the 10th Mountain Division there. Um, and then the other one stars, uh, Marco. Uh, uh, Mark O'Neill, who is the DCG Operations, myself, I'll talk about my role. Um, Carl Alex and David Haight. Uh, Carl was uh, north of the Bull, uh, at a place called Gamberry. Um, uh, uh, Dave was uh, uh, south of the Bull, at a place called Gardez. We'll talk about that in a sec. And then that's a nice little shot of all the coalition forces that were sitting in the headquarters at the time. Uh, I was the one Australian. Alright, that's what I intend to cover. I don't intend it to be an erudite uh, rendition of my time over there, but I am uh, uh, very cognizant of the military uh, attendance in the years. So I'm going to talk about things like uh, mission and intent, what was winning like, uh, operating principles and costs that the people that we lost whilst we were over there, uh, and there's still a uh, cost there. Uh, top left, uh, that is actually Bagram Air, Air Force uh, uh, Base uh, up in uh, um, uh, Parliament, which is where we were based. You've heard about Bagram. That's, um, you get lots of uh, badges when you're in an American unit. Uh, those are under them wraps with the, the, the hills behind a bag and covered with snow in winter. Uh, down the right hand, that is actually uh, an old Russian hangar. Uh, when 10th Mountain Division first arrived there in 2000, at the end of 2001, it was literally uh, strewn with meats and detritus of war. That was the place that uh, we were in. There's a building inside that, uh, protected by nice thin glass, and hopefully wouldn't explode, uh, the rocks wouldn't explode as it went through. Uh, it was a, a good place, and that the one just to the left, this is this new, very expensive building that was built that I moved to in the last couple of months. And that one there on the far left, that's an idea of a bag room, just the amount of equipment that was there, uh, just really incredible, the amount of equipment the Americans can put in the field for these sort of things. All right, um, I'm assuming um, and generally correct that people aren't completely familiar with uh, uh, Afghanistan, um, particularly since we're not there anymore. Uh, and I say that to the, uh, I think it's 250 folk that are there at the moment, it's 400 uh, um, uh, earlier this year. But uh, that's a quick uh, idea of uh, what it is. So there's Afghanistan there, uh, Iran, uh, Pakistan, and then all the stands over there that 
create endless uh, challenges for the people of Afghanistan. Landlocked country, there it is there. You've heard of a lot of these places. I'll talk about it, but uh, our area um, basically extended around here. I'll show that a little bit uh, more. So there's Bagram, Kabul, Jalalabad, and Ghazni. Um, uh, so uh, it's, it's, uh, you can see it's got an upper and lower house. Um, size of New South Wales, 80% size of New South Wales altogether, 34 provinces. Um, it is the Islamic Republic of <coughs> Afghanistan, we call it Jaroa, the government of the uh, Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. Um, 3.1 in, in, in the city, uh, population 32. Interestingly, it is very, the big difference between the urban population and the rural population. The urban are actually quite advanced compared to the rural. Uh, they obviously went backwards about 10 years ago, or as a result of the Taliban significantly, and actually there was the Russians, but uh, they've moved up pretty quickly, but the rule is still very much like it would have been a thousand years ago. Um, Ashraf Ghani is the uh, new president you would have heard of. He's actually sharing with Abdullah Abdullah, as only the Afghans can do. This is Afghan uh, good enough, uh, so they're basically the two people who are competing for the election basically share power, and the Afghans seem to make that work. Uh, you've all heard of uh, Hamid Karzai, various languages, various ethnicities. It is extremely Muslim, uh, it is, uh, um, Islam Muslim uh, as, as a country. Um. All right, there have been lots of wars in Afghanistan. So I'm not going to go back to the dim dark ages, and they have been literally at war for a very long time, and you've, you know about the British uh, several uh, attempts uh, not too successful. Uh, but the Soviets were in there in 79, they basically had a, a, a actually living in uh, Afghanistan before 79 wasn't too bad. In fact, Australians used to regularly travel. There might be some of you in this audience who have travelled to Afghanistan going to places that you dare not go now. Um, my, uh, my cousin did that in the 60s and, and went all the places that I used to go with a full escort and body armour, etc. Uh, but the Soviets came in. Uh, they, they got out, and obviously Mujahid Dini all heard about that in 89. They actually survived for quite a while uh, uh, after the Soviets pulled out, again because the Soviets were ploughing money in. Uh, and then the Taliban took over, 94 to 2001. If you've read anything about that, that, that was literally the dark ages, almost like Cambodia and Pol Pot, uh, heading that way very rapidly. Obviously, in 2001, as a result of 9-11, uh, the Allied forces came in, including Australians. Um, a lot of action over the east, in regional part of the east, you know, Tora Bora and all those sort of things. There, um, Hamid Karzai was appointed president. Um, the International Security Assistance Force, ISAF, was stood up. And so I was there literally at that end phase of uh, ISAF. ISAF terminated on the 31st of December last year and then was replaced by a resolute support mission. A little bit about that. So headquarters ISAF was a four-star. First it was General Joseph Dunford, who is now chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, Chiefs of Staff, a better gentleman you just can't imagine, a Marine, um, and then followed by uh, General Campbell. Uh, the three-star was actually 18th Airborne, uh, Lieutenant General Joe Anderson, um, and then there was a bunch of regional commands. Uh, resolutely support. There were six regions. Um, so this is Regional Command East here. Uh, Regional Command South, which you've all heard about, Kandahar, uh, Tarantau, all those areas, that's where the Australians mainly work. Um, RC Southwest was US, was a US uh, uh, um, uh, Marine force whilst I was there. Uh, the West was Italians, uh, Herat, a beautiful place, used to be the jewel in the ancient world, Herat. And it's a beautiful, beautiful city. Um, uh, very cultured, was very cultured. RC North, uh, where they've had all these issues up at Kunduz, but the Germans see that very much themselves. They, they have a lot of their heart and soul and, and blood invested in North, north uh, Afghanistan. And then RC Central had the Turkish uh, there, plus obviously the headquarters, etc. So um, uh, IJC is headquarters uh, uh, ISAF, uh, ISAF Joint Command. Uh, that was a three-star headquarters. So they took care of all the operational side of things whilst... Uh, so, uh, that was the circumstances there. Six regions, as you can see, that was the beginning of last year, and it's structured very differently now. Okay, so you can see RC East it literally sort of surrounds either sides of, of uh, Kabul, RC Central. All right, Regional Command East, and the reason I want to go through this is most people have some idea what Regional
regional command south is because we have invested a lot of our sweat and blood in regional command south, not that much in regional command east. So 14 provinces, it's literally sort of twice the size as far as army uh, aspects are concerned, 30% of the population, uh, you can see that number, it's actually twice the size of Tasmania, gives you an idea of how, how it is scope wise. The headquarters is based in Bagram, uh, which is Parham, just up here, uh, Kapisa, um, uh, Parham. Um, it surrounds uh, 30 plus bases, actually 34 bases, when he first got there of uh, uh, special forces and, um, and uh, you know, forward operating bases and strategic bases and um, uh, uh, district uh, um, uh, uh, special operations setups, etc., which we all considered sort of as, as part of our team. Um, commands the capital, 73,000 ANSF, Afghan National Security Forces. Uh, I'll talk about a bit about those later on. Um, uh, uh, two corps, uh, of which 37,000 plus ANA. So the two corps are the 201st and 203rd. All the other regions had only one corps, which is our equivalent to a division. So a corps in Afghan terms has four brigades, each brigade of about 4,000 plus some supporting uh, troops, uh, top engineers, etc, etc, etc. So, uh, uh, Major General uh, Zaman Waziri uh, commanded the 201st, north of Kabul, and that's the term I use, north of Kabul, and 203rd Corps, Major General uh, Mohammed Sharif Yaftali, Major General Yaftali, both, uh, both extremely capable and competent commanders. Um, it's got 1,200 kilometres uh, border with Pakistan. And that is absolutely significant as far as territory and geography is concerned in Afghanistan because that's where all the troubles come from. It's also where the trade uh, comes through. Um, literally, for one, you know, it is one of six regional commands that had almost half percent of uh, half of the kinetic activity in the whole of Af Afghanistan. Something called SIGAC, SIG significant acts that was always measured literally on a daily basis. So, uh, and interestingly. You look at that there, then you go to Regional Command South, which had a huge amount there, and then the rest of it was sort of scattered around. Noting that Regional Command Central in Kabul, that sort of began to increase quite significantly as the war progressed, and you probably hear a lot about that now. It's absolutely critical to US interests um, uh, for various reasons. It, 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 as far as the US are concerned, it covers the slipstreams from down here, absolute uh, uh, insurgency way through and then across through here, kind of past border with uh, Pakistan, etc. It has the major uh, air uh, point of departure and arrival, which is Bagram, and the, basically the road that goes west east goes through there, and it surrounds the capital. So uh, critical to their interests. It's got a bunch of thing, uh, places that you, you, you probably heard about. Talk and Gate, Kyber Pass is just over here. We had a base there. Um, yeah, uh, Jalalabad, a little bit of JBAT. Um, if you ever saw the Zero Dark 30, where the aircraft took, over, uh, took off to get Osama bin Laden, they took off from JBAT. If you saw Lone Survivor, that was set around JBAT, just to the north of uh, JBAT. Uh, the Kuna, up in the Kuna, that's actually the home of Al Qaeda, so up in the north, up here, northeast. Um, uh, the, the Ghazni, down in the south. Uh, well-known cultural festival again, uh, very much a cultural place. We actually had a major cultural festival whilst we were there. P2K, Paktia, Paktia, and Host. You heard about those. Down in Host, again, if you remember seeing Zero Dark, Dark 30, where those people were killed with that uh, uh, suicide bombers that came in, in Zero Dark 30, the, uh, those members of the other government agency, that was down in that area there. Um, Okay, Muristan, Kuna, and, and Nangarhar. So lots of well-known places uh, as far as Afghanistan is concerned. Um, and it's a critical uh, enemy uh, support zone. So obviously you can tell by the amount of action and activity that was happening in that area. So our regional command east is really, really important for the Americans. And that's why essentially they're pulled off most places, except we still have a presence there and will have a presence there going. That's the generic um, Okay. Might be slightly out of order with some of the things I'm about to talk about, but just to give you an idea so you understand where I sit in the, in the picture. Just up the top, that's 10th Mountain. That's 18th Airborne, sort of Sky Dragon. Um, that is the, uh, the symbol next to it. That's uh, 
uh, US forces Afghanistan, which is really a bit of a quandary having an Australian one star, you know, US forces Afghanistan headquarters position, really quite interesting. And last one, uh, that is uh, 3rd Infantry Division. Audie Murphy was a 3ID guy. Okay? Um, and uh, if you ever see, uh, um, uh, what's the name of the Audie Murphy film? Uh, anyway, where he plays himself. Uh, uh, Helen Back or something like that here. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, and they sing the old face soldier at the end of that. And actually, at the beginning of it. So uh, that's what we used to sing. Uh, once a week whilst we're over there, because we're on operations, when they're actually in barracks, they sing it every morning. Uh, everyone stands to attention. I can sing the words to it if you want. So, um, so from February to October, uh, Tenth Mountain were actually meant to be there for over a year. Uh, an advantage for Tenth Mountain people, because in American terms, if they were designed to be over there for over a year, they could actually get their one lot of leave. If they're there for less than a year, they don't get leave. But because they were meant to be there for a year, they were able to get leave. Um, so we were actually meant to be there until the beginning of 2015, but things changed as the world moved on. I was, uh, so Regional Command East, International Security System, combined Joint Task Force 10, 10 obviously from Tenth Mountain, Light Infantry Mountaineers, and I was the Deputy Commanding General Coalition Effects and Transitions. Forget about CET, it was a really an, an, an archaic term. Basically, imagine everything that is not picked up by uh, the direct, uh, Deputy Commanding General Operations and add a little bit of operation stuff and add retrograde and all that sort of stuff. Talk about that in a sec. Um, Basically, uh, Tenth Mountain left, uh, except for a stay-behind party of about 60 to 70 people um, uh, at the beginning of November, so we had our end of mission. Uh, we then handed over to, temporarily, to uh, 18th Airborne Corps, so Command of uh, I, uh, IJC, uh, ISAF Joint Command, Joe Anderson, but then there's his Deputy Commanding General Jeff Colt, um, who was in command of US Forces Afghanistan, and for a month, only the, yeah, an interesting way to do things, and we discussed a lot of times how this would be done. So for a month, they literally took over Bagram. That's why we had to keep all these people from Tenth Mountain behind, so that, that was a smooth transition. Um, so they became combined joint task force Bagram, US forces Afghanistan, uh, and I was just the deputy commanding general. There wasn't the other one. Uh, and then, at the beginning of December, 3rd Infantry Division came in, and I became the deputy commanding uh, general operations. Uh, so they picked up US 4 Alpha responsibilities, plus the Bagram Security Zone and a bunch of other things. Our, our, our responsibilities expanded at this area here to the whole of Afghanistan, beyond Regional Command East. Um, and Regional Command East actually fell apart, that, well, sorry, literally collapsed at that stage, the last of the regions to collapse as part of setting ourselves up for regional, uh, regional uh, for the Resolute Support Mission. Um, interestingly, um, Tenth Mountain, when I was there, that was their fourth time in Afghanistan. Fourth time in Afghanistan. They'd been in command of Regional Command South with Australians, and most of the people in Tenth Mountain Division knew Australians. The, uh, uh, the CJ3, um, um, that by the name of Colonel Mintz, actually was at the School of Infantry uh, for about two, three years, talked very fondly about it, but everyone had stories about Australians. And all the stories Americans ever tell about Australia are very they're good ones. So hopefully I added to that. Um, so they were there four times. They actually went to Iraq as well. And now, as of October this year, they went back to Afghanistan again, General Bannister. So literally a year's turnaround for the divisional headquarters to come back in. The brigades spin through it at an incredible rate. So they were um, Form 43 by Somalia, Haiti, Bosnia and Herzegovina. They are part of the three light fighting divisions that are part of 18th Airborne Corps, which is the contingency force. Third Infantry Division, I mentioned about them before, they have heavily, every war they've been engaged in from World War I, World War II, etc. have been heavily engaged. They've been in Iraq four times by the time they got to Afghanistan. And that's a very interesting thing, the way the Americans churn their people through. Um, it's not unusual for people to have three, four, five long deployments, long deployments um, in these places. So very, two very combat capable uh, divisions in the 18th Airborne Corps, of course, <coughs> commands, uh, at least 10th Mountain and others, um, it's quite a lot of experience as well. Alright, that gives you an idea of the sort of things that, uh, oh sorry, just an uh, idea of the coalition forces, you saw that at the beginning. We had Polish, Czech, Jordanian, Georgian, Canadian, UK, Australian, Romanian in the headquarters uh, in various roles, oh, and Afghans uh, as well, uh, plus lots.
loss of civilians. So it was very much a coalition effect, although well, it's very clearly uh, heavily um, uh, um, uh, US. Interestingly, there were Canadians, the Canadians had pulled out of Afghanistan before, but those people who the Canadians do a lot of exchange uh, and embedded work with the US, and they still go. So just have a quick look at that and tasks. So sustainment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Operations. There was a bunch of uh, bagman stuff uh, that I did, almost bagman mayorish. Uh, uh, combat commander uh, bagman obviously was uh, my two star uh, uh, general Townsend, but I was the one who did the day to day with the garrison. Uh, was quite heavily involved in operations, particularly in the bagman security zone, and particularly in enabling it. My my task in that area sort of morphed as I progressed and it actually became more operational as uh, 18th Airborne and 3rd Infantry Division came. Base realignment and closure, um, uh, bracket T, uh, that was the big issue, pulling ourselves off all these various bases, 34 bases down to only a few and each base with its own particular challenges. I won't go through it in detail if someone wants to ask me a question about it, but each of those was an operation, each of them highly complex, a whole of logistics aspect of it, from small bases to this, uh, you know, district support platforms when we were supporting special operations coming through to major port operating bases like Shank, which was a C-17 capable airfield, which we sort of threw down two or three times. Or um, and actually, we were doing a lot of work preparing for Kandahar coming come down as well. Uh, sustained operations, installation, defence and management, there was a lot of stuff, particularly as an armed corps person that I enjoyed in that area, working with the, the, with the folk who were defending Bagram, including the air defence, artillery, uh, um, uh phalanx uh, battalion that we had with us, um, all those things there. This one here, I just put it as a bullet point there, but uh, Afghan National Security Force uh, uh, development, significant task, full colonel, a lot of work in that area, and the trainers, guys, it's this. Um, standing up the replacements to 10th Mountain, number of boards, accident investigation, including aviation, civilian casualties, which is interesting, and then I chaired a couple of major um, uh, uh, joint casualty assessment teams, um, which were you know, where we had mass casualties or uh, inside attack things. So, very broad remit. Uh, I must admit, John Townsend was just fantastic. He told an untold number of politicians that were with me there saying, no, we don't consider him as an Australian brigadier, um, uh, 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 we consider him as a, 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 a deputy commanding general, who just happens to be Australian. And uh, that's very much how the way they treated it. And Tribal 10 didn't seem to be any issue when I was with 10th Mountain, we worked out a way around it uh, each time. Uh, but a really great board remit. Just something for everyone who hasn't worked with the Americans before, so there are two DCGs, DCGI and myself, so what does DCG do? Do you actually command all that sort of stuff? There's no question in anyone's mind that the commanding general, the two-star commands, everything. You provide what they call general officer oversight. Uh, now, the, you know which ones the boss is keenly interested in, and you provide that light stuff so it gets to him in the right form. A lot of the other stuff you literally take, take control of. But uh, um, staff still go direct to the boss if the boss asks them to go to. All right, there are a bunch of significant events whilst you were there, and, and, and you probably heard of a few of those uh, things. Um, Afghan and national, national elections. We had three goes of this. So, first one was in March. Uh, um, uh, they have a, 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 you know, multiple people uh, competing, it then reduces down to two, then they have runoffs. The runoffs were meant to be mid May. Of course, it didn't happen that way, it pushed to the right to June. Then, of course, People didn't believe the results at that stage. There's all kinds of issues you might remember in the news. And then we had to bring up, bring all the ballots in from around Afghanistan so that they could be painstakingly recounted. And then there was transfer to power with um, uh, the new president, uh, Ghani, and uh, the chief uh, operating officer, or executive officer, of the sort of agreement to work together. Uh, a bilateral security agreement and status of force agreement. You're probably well aware there was lots of delays in getting this signed. Uh, President um, Karzai refused to sign it, even though the lawyer Juba had signed off on it. And the problem was, we couldn't actually finalise any of our plans until that was signed off, because that was the legal status for us to be there. Bilateral security agreement is between the Americans and the Afghanis and uh, the SOFA, so that's the force of the agreement and then applied to everyone else. So that took a long time. Uh, the President got involved, etc. We got it sort of signed at the last moment. Um, Consequent of that was POTUS, President of the United States' decision on the first structure, and that affected how we played. Pakistan.
Pakistan offensive. I'm not sure if you were, but uh, Pakistan put a major offensive into the tribal areas. What that happened is it pushed a whole lot of uh, refugees, a lot of them uh, insurgents, into Afghanistan uh, through, uh, in, in the latter, latter part of the year with some challenges. Uh, we transitioned to the new mission, so the end of Operation Enduring Freedom in the uh, American terms to now what they call Freedom Sentinel, but the end of ISAF to Resolute Support. Afghan forces were definitely taking the lead, and I'll show you the, the, something later on that. Retrograde off 20 plus bases. Uh, each of them had to be transferred to the Afghans, each of them with lots of challenges, because what happened was every time we handed a base across the Afghans, what did they need to do? They need to have forces to secure it. So what happened is the Afghan National Army and the Afghan National Security Forces became more and more fixed because they required more and more forces on the bases to protect the bases. Therefore, less people would go out and do bits and pieces. Uh, and this is because uh, um, uh, President Karzai said, we will take every single base, every single base. In the end, we became very select about what we gave them at the end, not necessarily base-wise, but in stripping things down. Um, Regional Command East to the new trained by assist command. We transferred authority, so we literally closed Regional Command East. Huge reduction in forces and enablers, etc. So, for example, uh, 270 or so helicopters went down to about 104 helicopters. I'm looking at green helicopters there. Big change. Headquarters changed from very large to 274, uh, which is large in our terms, but that's, uh, that's what they changed to. Um, uh, we lifted off 2nd 203 Corps south of Kabul and we flew to advise them. So we talked to them and then we'd fly teams in to advise them and we set up uh, the new operations going forward. This gives you an idea of um, basically the transition of, to Afghans in the lead. Afghans in the lead. So um, in 2001, this gives you an idea of percentage of uh, uh, any initiated attacks, ISAF led operations. So 84%, most of the enemy action was against ISAF, as in coalition forces actions in 2011, only 16 there. You can see how the green goes ahead here. So the Afghans are now taking the force at the front. Uh, they are leading the operations, we are enabling them more and more by the time we get to 2014. It was even more stark in 2015. Okay. Uh, so just to give you an uh, idea in that, um, from January to April 14, um, there were 18 unilateral operations, that's where Afghans led. January to April 15, and that's beginning this year, 337 huge swing around, and that was all happening during the year that we, we were there. So when we finished, we assessed the ANSF as, as capable, um, that they needed to develop their ability in enablers, they were very good at artillery, with a lot of experience with D-30 houses, etc. Uh, but all the other ones, like military intelligence, the human school, but all the other things, uh, the civilians, um, uh, aircraft, obviously, we're developing their capability, etc., etc., etc. So a lot of that support needed to be provided, um, and uh, cross pillar, like you see, across all the various uh, uh, um, <coughs> police pillars. There's four police pillars. You know, they've got um, the Afghan Border Police, Afghan Uniform Police, Afghan Local Police, and Afghan National Civil Order Police. Four different versions of the police: Afghan National Army, Afghan Air Force, which is in our terms, really, probably more of a uh, you know a 16 aviation brigade, that's really an army air force, if that makes sense. Um, so basically, the Afghans have taken the lead on everything that we were there. I won't go through that in too much detail, except to say that this is basically what we arrived with, um, and then that's what we left at the other end. So we had. Um, north, uh, north of Kabul over to uh, um, um, 201 Corps, a one star headquarters plus an American brigade combat team minus um, at Danbury. And south of Kabul, we had a one star uh, headquarters with a brigade combat team minus. And then we actually had a brigade minus of uh, a Polish at Ghazni. So they've been in Ghazni for years and years and years. Um, an aviation brigade and all these enablers, um, garrison command, etc. This is, uh, we, we had a, uh, a, 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 basically a border control uh, centre at uh, Torpen Gate. Five, 455 AEW was air expeditionary wings, so they had, had, had a couple of squadrons, F-16s, A-10s were just absolutely brilliant throughout the activity. And then a 
whole bunch of in-location support. By the time we left, we had TAC East up at Gambari, a, a one-star headquarters with a brigade combat team, 3rd Cavalry Regiment there. Task Force White Eagle, so the Polish had literally collapsed to uh, uh, Bagram and were essentially a logistics organisation. Uh, the uh, amount of uh, aviation had significantly reduced. Bagram Security Force had a Georgian Light Infantry Battalion, Czech Company, Jordanian Battalion that finished up towards the end of the year, uh, an air defence artillery battalion which had been early in the beast. Uh, and then basically across the board we had significantly reduced 455 uh, AW, the air power had reduced significantly. So to give you an idea, people-wise, this is US people-wise, in 2012, January, 91,000, February 14, so when I arrived, 40,000, this is across Afghanistan, and the Resolute Support Mission set was 9,800, plus some other bits that sort of get calculated in a different way. So significant reduction, same in, in, in equipment, went from you know, 52,000 rolling stock in January 12, to 17,000 in February 14, to 5.5 thousand, 5,500 in January uh, 2015. So big changes in the way uh, that we structured, and we were all moving through that process. All right. Um, so Chief of the Army said to me, uh, and Chief Officer said to me, that's 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 why I was over there. Uh, Reinforcing support the U.S. Alliance. Naval, the Afghan National Security Forces, and to defeat the enemy. Regional Command East uh, did our own mission on top of that, and I'll go through that in a, in a, uh, in a moment. And our motto was Afghan success is our win. So this is all about enabling the Afghans to take over, be responsible for their security in Afghanistan. And we came up with a, a, a saying, Hankari, you can see it here, and this is a sort of a fist joining up all the pillars together. All together, Hampari and Dari, uh, Dari uh, and we say, you know, that cross pillar coordination. I'm not going to go too much through the threat. People think that there is one insurgency, there is a lot more than one insurgency, there's a whole lot of bits and pieces. It was interesting today, someone, uh, or literally a few days ago, you might have heard someone made a comment, they were surprised that they found an Al Qaeda uh, training camp up in the Kuna. Well, I can tell you, we wouldn't be surprised. The, 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 the uh, Al Qaeda training camp was very dispersed and they hid themselves. But we sort of had a view that Al Qaeda would be there forever. Um, they always, you know, once they, they retire from doing their stuff, they then go back to, to there. Obviously, our issue is to just to keep them controlled. You see our mission change. Akani Network uh, and Taliban were our major threats. A uh, lot of criminal networks causing lots of damage that people confused for insurgency throughout the place. Uh, lone wolves, a lot of the uh, the attacks were literally sort of lone wolves, as in people that just sort of turned for some reason. Uh, maybe got at, uh, never uh, uh, really knew what it was. And then ISIS towards the end. Uh, not in our area so much, up in the north and down the south, but you hear now that there's more ISIS connection in these areas here. Um, so the attacks were mainly on the ANSF. Um, and the types of things, you know, the, the insurgents were generally after high profile attacks, something like what insurgents always want, which is a whole lot of um, news media. So that's, they used to prepare themselves for really big attacks. Um, um, uh, um, uh, for example, in Kabul, you've heard about those. Um, and then there was a big attack in uh, Jalalabad on the NDS headquarters there and lots of other things. Uh, suicide bombers, we had a couple of those incidences. A lot of IDF, indirect fire, rockets fired at bases. Uh, altogether, direct fire, small arms, that was by far the majority uh, when we were out there with the Afghans. Some uh, uh, fire on aircraft as we hit approaches um, and all intended to sort of, uh, well obviously uh, create mayhem but also fix ANSF uh, around the place. So tax mainly on the ANSF, reduced significantly on the coalition and about 5% just on, on civilians around the place. Just to give you an idea, in Bagram, we had about 50 attacks in the nine months that we were there on uh, uh, rockets. There were occasional small arms, but we never was able to work out what it was. Worst case, and funnily enough, I always happened to generally be away, the worst ones was 11 rockets in one night. Um, uh, they don't, this is not many of them actually hit the base, but when they do, they can cause uh, some issues. We did lose some people killed. Uh, um, uh, and basically, our air defence had the phalanx systems and sensors. Better and better and better, and we're able to, to, 
to work through those. Uh, but uh, in the worst case, it was towards the end where a rocket actually hit. Uh, there's a palm detention facility there, which I won't go into the details of, and uh, a number of Afghans, like 30 plus, were wounded and one was killed uh, through that rocket and they were uh, Afghan prisoners in that area there. Uh, we lost a couple of um, um, uh, contractors and there were some near misses, uh, some really interesting near misses, so except we haven't been there. So, this was our mission, just to give you an idea. So the bit that is, um, <coughs> so the first, in, in black, that is in essence effective uh, mountain summit, and then it changed on the 1st of uh, August uh, uh, 14 to mountain ascent, obviously a connection to 10th mountain division. Um, the red bits are the bits that essentially that were added in altogether. Um, I think it's probably best to say it wasn't necessarily a two-phase operation, it was sort of morphed as we learned more and the situation <coughs> changed. So obviously the whole political circumstance changed the way that we played it and the timings and when the uh, things. So conduct security force assistance in support of the ANF's full security responsibility. So giving them the responsibility to take care of their country as a safe haven against international transition to resolute support and redeploy. And we, to support a competent, competent and integrated ASF. And here are the key tasks. Support ANSF full security responsibility Protect our force, disrupt the enemy with integrated synchronised operations through an ASF and coalition, transfer original command to East Mission Command functions to resolute support, conduct operational manoeuvre, and then um, NSAFE, ANSF, that's the Afghan security forces, and original command sufficiently confident in their abilities to protect the Afghan people, defeat the insurgency, and deny safe haven to the international terrorists. And we're posted to go, uh, go elsewhere. And uh, interestingly, Americans use this really well uh, as far as operating principles and uh, you know, imagining what winning looks like. Here's the two versions, 6th of February and 19th of August. So I think you can read most of that yourself. But a self-reliant ANSF has full responsibility for integrated security analysis and can secure the capital. So we added and secured the uh, our capital. We boosted up self-reliant. The bold is the bold we had. Uh, Al Qaeda unable to operate. Initially, it was from our regional command east, then effectively, so recognition that they are going to be around. <coughs> secure <coughs> acceptable elections, and then we said secure elections, and the Afghans were very good at securing it. And transfer of power, so that takes into account the fact that uh, of what happened in the elections. The constructive ANSF pack mill. Pack, uh, so one of the things that we're really concerned about is that Afghan-Pakistan relationship and the Americans did a lot to uh, be the nexus to make sure that happened. And in the end we changed that to respond appropriately to cross-border incidents along with the thing. Uh, retrograde complete and then mission command transfers. We first thought it was going to be IJC. The decision was made not to keep that three-star headquarters uh, and then that was the change there. So that was always in our mind when we were conducting operations. So uh, what I have seen, um, and, I, and I think with great success, is this use of operating principles. So that's basically some guidelines that you should, you know, this is your uh, uh, commander's intent. If you're doing anything, you should keep these in your mind. i call used it very effectively for Talisman Saber. It's a concept they use all the time. So, if in doubt, refer back to these. There's a bunch of other ones as well. And I'll just pick out a, out a couple. You know, maintain operational reserve. So whilst we were doing retrograde operations, you can see from there, it was very clear, very clear that we must always be posted to defend our troops and protect our troops. And uh, you can see that we basically came off basis and we made sure that when we were withdrawing equipment, we left the tactical stuff to the end, we actually reinforced as we came out, and each one was seen and, and, and briefed as such as a significant tactical operation because there is that you know, desire from logisticians or other people who want to reduce numbers of, of equipment, etc., to get all that stuff out as soon as possible. We want to keep as much there so that we can protect ourselves as we come out, uh, and you'll see where that's, that's coming from. You can also uh, see um, the intent of getting you know, uh, ANS. F, uh, completing this operational tempo and working their way through that. 
But again, there are a bunch of these uh, um, that we used to just basically use all the time when we were considering anything. That's just a, a quick one on the elections, a little, nice little card that they uh, 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 um, showed on how effective it was. My view is that um, the Afghans were really successful in securing the elections. There was a significant increase in SIGAX, up to 170, 180, about the same amount for each of the elections uh, in March and June. Um, and there was inspirational stories of insurgents attacking uh, ballot boxes, uh, the local population uh, combining with the Afghan National Police or the ANA, fighting off the insurgents, and then an hour or two later, opening up the ballot booth again and coming back to vote. So they were really determined to have their votes, and people like that, in my mind, are quite inspirational and the reason why we, in my view, we should be supported. Um, so we made it very clear that we didn't want to be seen to be supporting the Afghan National Security Force during this. Uh, we had to see it, they had to be the front runners all the time. Um, you know, People think that Afghanistan's, uh, you know, we've got a few people there. Um, we're still losing lives there. Uh, this is what we lost uh, in the regional command of the east. Uh, and just following, we lost 21 killed um, whilst I was there uh, from regional command of the east. Um, this is in the headquarters. This actually is a CH-47 Chinook carrying a big pole from uh, um, the Twin Towers that was actually mounted in the courtyard. Every politician that came, they got their photo there. And here is the list of names that we lost and they, the, the, their faces would, would roll up in the screen as you walked into the headquarters. Um, so 21 folk all together. Um, the worst case was the five checks you saw there. Uh, I said I was doing joint casualty assessment teams. Um, on the 8th of July, uh, a suicide bomber walked into the location. Uh, whilst they were doing some operations, they'd gone to investigate a point of origin, which is where a provocative had been fired the night before. Um, they pushed, put themselves next to a clinic that had been built by the Koreans. Um, a suicide bomber walked in uh, and set himself off, um, killed five Czechs, uh, and killed uh, about seven local uh, national kids and two adults. Uh, and a bunch of investigations, and we investigated very uh, carefully because there was some concern. Also, well, just because the whole nature of it, but also whether it was an insider attack, was it not water, or etc. But that was probably the, 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 one of the worst, but uh, the others would go through as they are. Alright. So, um, this finishes it off, noting that I haven't gone in any detail into any really of the responsibilities, just to give you an idea. Um, uh, for those of you who have been uh, deployed before, nothing more moving than being deployed on Anzac Day. That's our small service at Bagram. Uh, we uh, were able to hog tie a Kiwi, so we got a Kiwi there, we couldn't find a Turk. Uh, we had about seven or eight of us there. Uh, um, and there's a small special forces detachment, huge turnout from US special forces and British forces that were around the place. That was great. Um, this is a, a lawyer group, basically a, 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 a surer, uh, getting the local people together talking about security in Bagram. That is up uh, uh, in the Kunar at Sardabad. Um, they have three T5 uh, uh, tanks uh, there. Interesting stories about those. Uh, uh, Major General uh, Yaftali, uh, Jordanian commander, that's his end of mission. Um, this is my team, my first team. I had two different teams about to go out from NREC uh, outside Parwan. That's me at uh, Talking Gate. Um, that's my second crew, just out uh, near at Fault Right, and that's a, a prominent, prominent uh, female uh, um, uh, um, Afghani politician who at the time was actually berating us with a lack of support. Uh, and I'm sitting here smiling through, through the interpretation, but uh, uh, very good to see uh, increased um, uh, representation. Alright, so I'll leave it at that stage. Um, uh, so thank you very much for your time. Obviously, it's up to you. Thank you very much. Uh,